and we'll just be with a few uh, closing, you might say, uh, thoughts and lessons on um, 2 Timothy chapter 4. Finished last week at about 12 or 13, verse 12 or 13. So by verse 14, uh, as we wind our way through here, we'll pick it up at verse 14. And let me read those passages. Alexandra, the coppersmith, did me much evil. The Lord reward him according to his works. Of whom he, though thou were... Of whom be thou ware also. In other words, a warning. Beware of him. Uh, okay. I, I'm sounding good over this. Let me push this button. Thank you for reminding me. And if, da if David is standing back there, that generally means I've done something wrong. One, two, three, go. All right. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 14. Alexander the coppersmith did me much evil. The Lord reward him according to his works, of whom be thou ware also, for he hath greatly withstood our words. Uh, at my first answer, no man stood with me, but all men forsook me. I pray God that it, it may be not be laid to their charge. Notwithstanding, the Lord stood with me and strengthened me that by me the preaching might be fully known and that all the Gentiles might hear. And I was delivered out of the mouth of the lion. And the Lord shall deliver me from every evil work and will preserve me unto his heavenly kingdom to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. And then of course the sign off, verse 19 through verse 21. But in verse 14, notice if, if you would, uh, he he names a name, and the, the, the name is Alexander. And, uh, and he even wants you to know exactly which Alexander. It's the coppersmith. Alexander the coppersmith, and then he finishes the statement, did me much evil. There's a good chance that Alexander was in the work there, possibly was a Christian. I'm not going to say for sure. But uh, there will be differences of opinions, uh, differences of character, uh, differences of all statues and statuses, but there should not be a difference in doctrine. And I believe that the difference here was probably a doctrinal thing or the Apostle Paul would have never mentioned the man's name. It uh, wouldn't be worthwhile just because someone had a difference of an opinion. That's fine. But if your difference in your doctrinal stance, he probably felt it was worthy. Let me mention this. Another place he says, mark them that cause divisions among you. And that divisions among you had to be with the doctrines, the fundamental doctrines of the faith. And if someone's contrary to the word of God, obviously in the New Testament and here, even today, he says to mark them that cause divisions among you. So that's probably what's going on. It is probable that a saved person in the church can cause much harm, especially if he's of another belief, another doctrine of some important, should we say, red line doctrine, uh, like salvation by grace through faith, plus or minus nothing. And if they add something to that, then obviously if, if you're a Bible-believing church, New Testament church, you couldn't allow that person to get up and teach that doctrine. Just couldn't do that. So very probable, and I use the word probable because I think it happens more than you know. People may not be too clear about what they actually believe until they get into a position in a church and then after they're in that position, they begin to teach their dogma, their doctrine, uh, contrary to the Word of God, around our church, we're a King James Bible church. And uh, if someone comes in, oh, yeah, we believe the King James, believe the King James, and maybe they get a chance to teach. And the, next, the first thing you know, they pull out uh, another translation of the Bible and say, well, a better rendering is this right here. We don't believe that at all. And that could cause much harm in a Bible-believing church. So just an illustration. Um, 
so it's probable that a seed person in the church can cause much harm. And uh, therefore, your leadership in the church, your pastor, your assistant pastors, your uh, other called preachers in the church, uh, even down to the next office in the church would be the deacon, uh, ought to be aware and ever cautious of those that are wanting to maybe teach a different doctrine or from another Bible or something like that. So the possibilities are real. You say, well, what causes this? What happens? I thought, you know, everybody's on the same page. I mean, we all went to grade school and we, we learned uh, uh, about the English language. We learned about math. And doesn't two plus two always equal four? Isn't the word of God the same way? No, I wish it was. No, because in the practical sense of things, I get that scenario. But in the spiritual side of things, you see, there are other spirits. And the devil has an agenda. And the forces of evil and the forces of hell are against the things of God, the word of God, and the doctrine of God. And, and he'll use anybody or anything, any way he can, to cause much harm. So got to be careful here. So let me give you a, a for instance of somebody in the church uh, that may, because I said the possibilities are real. Because, and I wanted to give you some reasons why the possibilities are real. <laughs> because of sin. Amen. Amen. <laughs> that, that changes the, I mean, you let somebody get to messing around with sin, especially somebody in a teaching position or a leadership position, the next thing you know, they're going to be, they're not going to be teaching right. Uh, so sin, how about self? It's just one of the, nothing changes. I mean, somebody's really full of themselves and, well, I said so and that ought to settle it. No, God settles it, amen, with the word of God. So, so there's sin, self, I'm going to give you three reasons, and the devil. <laughs> He's there. People, uh, they don't, sometimes I think they miss the spiritual side of things that, oh, well, you know, well, we're all living in harmony and peace, love, and joy, and brother, there's no foul spirits anymore. There's no devil. Nothing. Like you, you better watch that thing, because there's evil forces of hell at every church service. Amen. Uh, let me give you an illustration of the Bible. First Corinthians chapter 5, verse 1 through verse 7. Now, we said the possibilities are real, that someone could teach wrong or be, because of sin, we said, or self, or the devil. And it says uh, in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, and this thing come before the church here, it is reported commonly there is fornication among you. Let me stop right there. This is somebody in the church that was taken in sin, and uh, that fornicated, fornication thing was not a spiritual thing there. It was a physical thing because he was uh, attracted sexually to his father's wife, so on and so forth. So it's reported commonly that there's fornication among you. And you know, you can't have a person like that, let's just say living with somebody else, shacked up with somebody else, teaching in your church. I don't think you even want them on the platform singing, playing an instrument or anything. You say, why? Because of sin. And you're sending the wrong signal to the people that want to live right and want to do right or the ones that are on the line that don't know, well, what about this and what about that? And, you know, I, uh, uh, I have mixed feelings about this and that. And if you send that, what will happen? Much harm will come to the church. So, and by the way, there's, there's more than just physical fornication, although this is physical application. There is spiritual fornication. That's when somebody's flirting around with idolatry and flirting around with other spirits and other doctrines, and that's termed in the Scriptures as spiritual fornication. But let's hold it to the physical side of things. It is reported commonly that there's fornication among you, and such fornication as is not so much as named among the Gentiles that one should have his father's wife. Could I say this as a preacher? If you've got a situation like that in your church, that that family, although they're, they're in the church, I, I wouldn't be letting them teach Sunday school class. 
I, if, if somebody's shacked up or living with somebody or doing that kind of stuff, I think you've got to draw the line. And you've got to say, no, that's not going to happen because of this. You say, why? Well, you know, they're just people like anybody else in the world accepts that thing. But the Scripture doesn't accept that. God doesn't accept that. And so we want to err to the side of caution rather than the side of the world. So here, uh, and, and verse 2 says, and ye are puffed up. Uh, puffed up is just some, somebody full of themselves. I said sin and self, remember? Puffed up and have not rather mourned, uh, and it wasn't bothering them at all. They weren't upset about it. They wasn't, he says, that he that had done this deed might be taken away from among you. Well, they were kind of, well, everything's okay. It's all good. Everybody does it. That's not the right attitude. And that's a picture of Alexander the coppersmith who done him much harm. Say, what did Alexander do? Well, he spoke words against the word of Paul and the word of God. And so he was in defiance to doctrinal stance. So these two parallels are the same. They're both caused by sin or self. So watch our text in 1 Corinthians 5, verse 3. For I verily, as absent in body, so Paul wasn't there, but present in spirit, and on the spiritual side of things, the Holy Ghost of God, the Word of God, uh, the spiritual makeup of the body of Christ, have judged already as though I were present concerning him that hath no, has so done this deed. So he's calling him out. And yet today, oh, you don't want to call them people out, man. That'll, that'll put a shockwave through the church. And if they leave, that family there will leave. And that family over there will leave. And that family over there. Say, what is that? That's the fear of man. You'd be better to fear God and do what's right. And it, verse 4, if the, the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, uh, in, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when ye are gathered together, and my spirit, with the power of the Lord Jesus Christ, to deliver such an one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus Christ. So there's a biblical way to handle this, and it looks like it's done openly uh, in the midst of the congregation. It might be dealt with by the men of the church, and then if need be, if it's not taken care of, brought before the church, and then if that doesn't get right, then set them outside the church. You're, you're done here. Uh, and it's never a pleasant thing. Now, don't get me wrong. That's, that's the last thing you want to see. Because we're in the business of helping people. And some people get into this stuff ignorantly. And, and the fix for it is somebody sit down and tell them the truth about it. And then they get it fixed. And we, we can go on. We can forgive them. And we can pray for them and keep going. But anyway, verse 6, your glorying is not good. So they were kind of glorying in the fact that I guess they had that going on. Know ye not that a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump? <laughs> Said you let a little something like that go on, the next thing you know, the whole bunch of you is going to be in error. going to be a lot of harm to the church. Purge out therefore the old leaven, that ye may be a new lump, as ye are unleavened. For even Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. So very clear words by the Apostle Paul, 1 Corinthians chapter 5, 1 through 7, dealing with an issue in the church and someone else whom he names and calls out before the church. they got to get this thing right. So back to our verse, Alexander the coppersmith. So it's not wrong if you have to name a name. It's, it's never pleasant. It's, it's sad. Uh, but he says, rebuke them before all. In, these, in the light of this, that others may fear. And boy, the last thing anybody ever wants to do is point somebody out. And I think maybe you could go to them personally, one-on-one. -on -one. We've had lessons on that, how you handle that. And uh, you see where they're at. If they're blatantly bold in their sin, then they might have to be exposed for what they're really doing. So Alexander the coppersmith did me much harm. Verse 14, again, the Lord reward him according to his works. Now that's, that's a rough passage right there people say well rains on the just same as the unjust yeah well yeah what's it raining uh hell hail fire rain <laughs> be careful uh look again with first corinthians chapter 3 verse 12 and and he's and i want you to notice the word here the lord reward him according to his works now you know since the moment you got saved, everything you do 
in the body, <laughs> in the flesh, because you live in the flesh, is a work, some kind of a work. Uh, if, if you have works meet to the pleasure side of things, and before you got saved, maybe you, you I don't know, pick something, fished, race cars, flew airplanes, I don't know. Uh, pan for gold someplace, I don't know. what. It's just in you, man. You just got to do this. Then you get saved, and God gives you every opportunity to have some good works, but you say, no, I've already got my pattern set up. I'm going to go on out here and do this, but I'm going to do it all for the glory of God. I don't think so. If it don't line up with the Word of God, that work is a bad work, and it'll, it'll come full circle to get you. Watch this, 1 Corinthians 3.12. Now, if any man build upon this foundation, gold, silver, precious stone, wood, hay, and stubble, he's speaking of Christ, because Christ is the foundation. Every man's works, every man, and I like the clearness here, every man, nobody's exempt. Every man's works, that means every person that's saved, that's a child of God, has some kind of works. They're either good works, for the Lord Jesus Christ, the cause of Christ and Christianity, purity, holiness, and righteousness, or their <clears throat> other works, works of the world, works of pleasure, works of desire, works of your preference that have nothing to do with God. And you can say all you want to, well, I'm just doing it as unto the Lord. You know, I used to do it unto myself and the world, but now I'm doing it unto God. Be careful with that thing, because if it don't line up with the Word of God, it, it, you can't make it work, line up the Word of God just because you said it lines up with the Word of God. You say, how do you tell? Well, if it keeps you out of church on Sunday... Say, well, I'm just as close to God out there in my tracker bass boat on the lake as you are in the pew there on Sunday. No, because that, that's an apparent contradiction to Scripture where it says, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, the manner some is, and you're trying to make what you do godly, and you want to be called a Christian, you're a hypocrite. Oh, sorry, I'm getting a little off base here. Watch out, watch out. So now if any man build upon this foundation, gold, every man's work shall be made manifest. So whatever you do after you're saved falls into the category of works of good and works of bad. And you say, well, how do I, how do I figure that thing out? Line them up with the Word of God. What are you doing? Does, does it honor God? Does it honor the Word of God? Does it honor of the work of God? You say, well, I... Oh, yeah, if I stretch it a little bit, it'll be, no, no stretching, amen? Just line up with the book, watch this. So he said, they're going to be manifest. In other words, they're going to be brought to light. They're going to be big full circle. They're going to flash your save life upon a screen, and we're going to see what you did for Christ and what you didn't do for Christ. Oh, Brother Phil, does that mean you too? Yeah, it means me too. And I hope you're not there, but you probably will be. He says, for the day shall declare it, and that day is the judgment day, judgment seat of Christ in this instance. That day shall declare it because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's works of what sort it is. Now, it's either going to be gold, silver, precious stone, or wood, hay, and stubble. Can I just say this? Most Christians are laying up wood, hay, and stubble instead of gold, silver, and precious stone. Say, oh. And why would anybody in their right mind work their life away, their Christian life away, for wood, hay, and stubble? Oh, you think it's that simple? Exactly that simple. So people say, well, I don't know why you go to church every Sunday morning and every Sunday night and every Wednesday night, and you've done that all your life, ever since you've been saved. You've been, yeah, I'll tell you why. <laughs> What's that evangelist friend that we had? Bob Carrico. I don't know if anybody remembers Bob. He had a message, I owe, I owe for all to church I go. <laughs> he had a pretty good idea about what God had done for him, amen. And so he just felt like he probably ought to step up and work, learn, love, love the Lord, do for the Lord. A lot of Christians don't have that idea. They are not going to show up. They're going to be at their leisure, have their preference, do what they want to do so on and so forth. Watch this. He says, 
Every man's works shall be tried. If any man's works abide which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. So it's all based on getting a reward or losing a reward. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved. So I'm not talking about whether you're saved or lost here. That was settled at Calvary. It depends on how you serve God today. Uh, yet so as by fire, he says, verse 16, Now know ye not that ye are the temple of God, and so he brings into that body, that physical body that you and I have, and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you, and the Spirit dwells in you. You say, well, if the Spirit dwells in me, uh, then, then, then I can't sin. No, the flesh don't get saved. The flesh is still a taker. It's still uh, addicted to habits, uh, personal fleshly, worldly preferences. Amen. <laughs> Where the Spirit of God is addicted to holiness, righteousness, truth, Love, joy, peace, long-suffering in that whole list over there, Galatians chapter 5. Uh, isn't it amazing how people justify themselves when you get them in the light of the Scripture? Oh, you know, I, I, I mean, I, I did it for Jesus. I, you know, I love the Lord, man. I won that lottery the other day. I did it all for Jesus. Yeah, sure. <laughs> sure you did. <laughs> You know, well, they'll, they'll justify their life. They've lived the way they wanted to live all their life. And, brother, they stayed out of church and didn't do this and didn't do that. And, matter of fact, had words of advice for those that did. And, you know, you're becoming a fanatic. God forbid. But now all of a sudden, you know, they get a little older and they justify their whole life and say, Yeah, well, I live for Jesus, you know. No, you didn't. And you say, I can't sort that out, and I really don't try to sort that out. But guess what? God will sort that out one day if you're a child of God at the judgment seat of Christ. Amen. Say, where do you think Alexander will be? I don't think he's going to be in good light if he was a saved man because of the harm that he did to the Apostle Paul and the church that he started. And so Paul, uh, he, he lined him out and said, hey, that guy needs to get right. He caused us a lot of harm around here. And one of these days when you stand face to face to God, uh, eyeball to eyeball, toe to toe, and you can sweet talk it, spin it, whatever you want to be. In that day, you're going to be dealing with a righteous judge that sees right through your soul. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> and you say, man, you're trying to scare me. I don't know. Therefore, knowing the terror of the Lord, we persuade <laughs> men. <laughs> I, I don't know. <laughs> what do you think? Might be an incentive to serve God right. Amen. Amen. <laughs> It sure has worked on me over these years. But here he's going to suffer some loss, the scripture says. Verse 17, if any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy. For the temple of God is holy, which temple ye are. And that temple is the body, and you defile that thing, and you do the things you want to do. Um, that could be anything that, any drug, uh, I guess any habit that caused stress problems life itself causes enough verse 18 let no man deceive himself and there's the problem people are experts at deceiving themselves and brother when you hear them talk well that i'll tell you what you think they could walk on water well if they just say the truth they'd be like the man job i abhor myself have you ever heard anybody say they've lived all their life and they say, man, I wouldn't change a thing. I don't know. I've tried to live for God all my life. And if I could go back, there'd be a lot of things I'd change. I'd do them better. I'd sell out more. I'd live closer. So I have self-deception is a powerful, a powerful uh, thing when you deal with folks. So here, if any man among you seemeth to be wise in this world, let him become a fool that he may be wise. Boy, that's good advice for the child of God. For the wisdom of this world is foolish just with God. I'm in, I'm in 1 Corinthians 13, about verse 19. For it is written, he taketh the wise in their own craftiness. Boy, some folks, I'm, he's talking safe folks here. Just think they're so smart about this, so smart about that. And, and they say, well, I, 
You know, if it hadn't been for my intelligent level and my high IQ, I wouldn't be where I'm at today. No, if it hadn't been for the grace of God, you wouldn't be where you're at today. I don't run across many Einsteins out there, amen? But people are pretty easily deceived. Uh, people have told me most of my life, you shouldn't run yourself down so much. Why? I'm the cheapest of sinners. Amen. And brother, if you've got a high esteem of yourself all the time, or about any time, look out, you're headed for a fall. Verse 20, I'm in 1 Corinthians 3. And again, the Lord knoweth the thoughts of the wise, that they are vain. So, uh, don't care how smart you think you are, <laughs> in the eyes of God, it's all emptiness, vanity. You may think you got it figured out, and you fool God, and you live in America, and you can do what you want to do. Not according to this Bible, you can't. Watch it. Therefore, let no man glory in men. Amen. For all things are yours. Yeah, amen. They are. All things are. And I enjoy that. I love living in America. But you know what? I know who my God is. I know how insignificant I am and how all-powerful he is. Whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas or the world or life or death or things present or things to come, all are yours. Yeah, but you better have the right perspective on that thing. And ye are Christ, and Christ is God's. <laughs> Boy, that kind of puts a new spin on it, doesn't it? <laughs> well, I was in verse, back in our text, I need to try to finish this up. Verse 15, of whom be thou, I'm in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 15. Of whom be thou where also, he's talking about Alexander the coppersmith. And by the way, of whom be thou where also, that's a warning, beware of. So it's not unusual for a pastor, leader in the church, evangelist, a missionary, somebody that's in the Word of God, ministering, a teacher somewhere, and, young, and teachers are all, Always warning young people, and aren't we as parents even warning our children? And we'll say to our children, we'll see them making friends, somebody down the road or something will say, hey, be careful over there. I don't know if I, I don't like what I see out of those folks, and I don't really want you hanging around them. Why would a, and that's just parental skill. That's just, you know, the Bible teaches us evil communications Corrupt good manners. So the last thing you want is your children hanging around with somebody with evil communications. Amen. You say, why? Because it's going to affect your kid, your child. Now, step into the church. Same here. Leaders. Well, I'm an adult, and I should be able to make my own decisions. You'd be surprised how blind we are sometimes. Amen. When it comes to spiritual things and discerning. Discerning. And that gift of discerning comes through the Word of God and knowing the Word of God because now you can line things up with the Word of God. So it's not unusual to hear your leadership, your pastor, your teacher, or somebody in your church say, now be careful, don't prove everything by the Word of God. Amen, amen. You say, that's, prove all things, hold fast that which is good. That's what the Scripture says. So that's what we want to do. So we're careful there. So of whom be thou aware of. So it's not unusual to hear a pastor or somebody give you a warning as people. Be careful now. Make sure you line that up with the Word of God. Somebody brings in a good book, you know, on something and bring it in and say, oh, look at this preacher. This is the next big thing. You say, well, better, you know, read that book in one hand and keep the Bible in the other. Weigh it all out by the Scriptures. What's he doing? He's warning you. Beware of that. Beware of that guy that wrote that thing. That might get you in trouble down the road somewhere. But the scriptures never will. So beware of them, Alexander, beware of this guy. They will cause the ministry much harm, and people like that do. If they don't get their way, they will leave the church after speaking damaging words against the word of God or the man of God. And that's what's happening here. And that's what happens, man. You, you keep preaching the Word of God, teaching the Word of God, preaching the Word of God, teaching the Word of God, and it just rubs somebody just a little bit the wrong way, 
And brother, they'll be back over here. Hey, you want to go to dinner today? Let me, t let me buy your lunch for you. Man, they got a KFC up here in Batesville that's got the best chicken I have ever. Let me take you to lunch. And you're thinking, the flag goes up, you know, and you're thinking, why all of a sudden they want to take me to lunch? <laughs> But, boy, that chicken sure sounds good, and them mashed potatoes, you know, they got the little taste of sour cream in there, and that gravy, that's, that's to die for. So they, <laughs> and you know that box of biscuits they give you. And you know what? If you should have a biscuit left, you take that thing home. How'd I get on this? And you let that thing sit on the counter in that box, and it gets all hard. You know it's still good if you'll put it in the microwave for 15 seconds and dee, 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 get that thing out. Oh, man. I think I'll have lunch with you. Boy, they get you up there and they buy you, I don't know, well, they got 20 pieces for $20. I don't know. They got a deal. They always got a deal. And here it comes. Did you hear what Brother Phil said this morning in Sunday school class? Who does he think he is? You know, he was talking about of no reputation and he was talking about that he's the offscouring of the earth. Can I tell you, he's all those things. We need to get rid of him. And that chicken ain't tasting as good as it did. When you <laughs> Say, what happened? <laughs> you got played, man. <laughs> Say, it don't happen. It happens all the time. <laughs> Somebody wants to take you to lunch. The flag ought to go up. Uh-oh, now watch. Somebody say, Brother Phil, you want to go to lunch? I say, nope, not today. <laughs> Ah, oh, hey, we have I better better watch out here. We we're having a time, ain't we? I'm just telling you how it really is. <laughs> you know, <laughs> of whom be thou aware also? So be be careful, that guy. Could you come over to my house this afternoon? I've got a Bible study going on over there. You know, Brother Phil just ain't getting it out there. Let me straighten out some of the stuff he's been saying. Oh. Be careful. They just don't teach right down there. You need to come to my house on Tuesday, and then you don't even have to go Wednesday to church. Yeah, all right. Beware of them. They will cause the ministry much harm. And if they don't get their way, and that's all they're after is their way, they will leave the church after speaking damaging words against the word of God or the man of God. They will be against your words. And that's what Alexander was. That means they won't hear you. In other words... I just don't think I want to hear what the pastor has to say. I'll find myself something else to do. I'll go back to the back and I'll clean the kitchen while he's preaching. Huh? Happens all the time. He says, they will avoid your teaching. You know what? That brother Phil, I don't know who he thinks he is. I'll just show up for church. I won't even come for Sunday school. Oh, Brother Phil, you think that happens? Yeah, and did you hear Jeremiah teach Wednesday night? I don't think I'm coming back on Wednesday night. I, uh, <laughs> and I heard Pastor Tom's back this morning. Let's see what he's got to say. <laughs> All right. <laughs> They will be, and Alexander was against his words. They will be against your words. That means they won't hear you. They will avoid your teaching and preaching. And sometimes they won't know that the devil is using them to do his work. They are captives and don't even know it. And they'll tell you they're the most spiritual thing they ever walked on the face of the earth or through the church doors. Be careful. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 24 through verse 26. And I'm almost done here. We taught on this. I think somebody said something about it Wednesday night. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 24. And the servant of the Lord must not strive, and I'm not trying to strive, but be gentle unto all men. Oh, take it easy. I'm being kind. Gentle to all men. Apt to teach. And oh, I'm apt to teach. I've always loved teaching. He said, patient. And I've been patient 44, 45 years now. <laughs> in meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves. And that's what we're doing this morning. If God preadventure will give them repentance to the acknowledge of the truth, 26, and that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil who have taken them captive by him at his will. You say, who is that? Alexander the coppersmith or anybody else that don't want the word of God. I got to quit. We're having so much fun here. I, I may squeeze another lesson out of this. I don't know. Who knows? That's number 29. That's lesson number 29 in 2 Timothy. And there, there may, I didn't get finished, so there might be 30 lessons 
in the book of 2 Timothy, and we'll try to finish next time. Thank you so much for listening, and trust that you enjoy it half as much as I do. Thank you for coming. Father, thank you for this morning. Thank you for a chance to teach your word. Bless the preacher as he preaches. Give him his strength and his power. And Lord, the singers and all that's done, uh, anything we do here, may it bring the glory and honor. Save that sinner uh, that's nearest hell today here in our service. In Jesus' name we pray and ask it. Amen. God bless you. Good.